Hello and welcome to episode 253 of the Mark and Me podcast. As always, I'm your host Mark. Now joining me on today's episode is the singer, songwriter and frontman from the incredible 100 Reasons. Yes, I'm joined by Colin Duran. Only a few days ago, I released my most recent episode with actually the guitarist of 100 Reasons, Larry Hibbert. But today, it's all about Colin. Colin is someone that I've wanted on Mark and Me now for about five years. When I grew up, genuinely, when I lived in Leicester, sort of my uni days, my most listened to bands were Headers for Heroes, 100 Reasons and Reuben. So to sit down today and talk about this with Colin in great detail, talk about their comeback tour, their brand new album which is out now, Glorious Sunset, and is unbelievable. And just basically get to hang out and talk loads to someone that I have so much respect for and is one of my idols is a dream come true. So that interview will be coming up in just a couple of moments time. But as I just mentioned, on my last episode, I was joined by Larry. And I just want to say a massive thank you to everyone that tuned in, everyone that shared the episode and the response was amazing. I've seen people this week that have been going to the 100 Reasons comeback shows and the feedback is incredible. So I can't wait for this weekend for me to go along to Birmingham and see this gig, which for me might be the gig of the year. You've got My Vitriol, Headers for Heroes and 100 Reasons. So if you're listening to this now and there's still tickets for next weekend, go and do it. And if you see me, buy me a beer and let's (laughs) let's hang out in Birmingham. But let's get to today's interview because it's a big one. And for me, it's a huge, huge interview from someone that I've wanted on this podcast for a very long time. So I think the best thing to do now is to get straight to that interview. So here's me and Colin talking all things music. So Colin, thanks for joining me today on the Mark and Me podcast. No worries, pleasure to be here. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. No worries. Uh, what I like to do, Colin, is for anyone that might be tuning in for the first time is take it right back to the very start. Um, I'm not talking the start of 100 Reasons, I'm talking the start for you. So when you're growing up, can you tell me about those first albums that you remember buying maybe with your pocket money or uh, you were doing a paper round and earning some money or something <laughs> and buying those first CDs or tapes that made you basically love music? Yeah, I mean, it's quite we sort of, you know, you sort of grow up around music, your friends at school listening to music and stuff. And I've, you know, I suppose the first album I actually bought was kind of Prince Charming. But I remember when I was older and I kind of bought my first CD player and I went and I I, I bought four CD albums and it was Alice in Chains Dirt. I think it was uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers, um, but it was like a best of thing they had with the older stuff before they signed to Warners definitely um Anthrax I think the sound of white noise and um I don't know why I think it might be Faith No More Angel Dust oh wow I mean those were foundations to build on fucking hell I mean I remember like a friend at work when I worked you know and I was buying my first CD play he kind of gave me a tape of Alice in Chains Dirt and that was just incredible so I thought I've got to buy that Angel Dust is just a classic, so yeah, I'm going to do that. Um, Sound of White Noise of Anthrax. I wasn't always like, I mean, I totally appreciate Anthrax as a band, but I really quite liked some of the tracks off of that record, whereas not being necessarily a massive Anthrax fan before. Um, So yeah, it was cool. That's awesome, man. I mean, some bands come on here and I think they try and say cool stuff because they don't want to admit that they had like Michael Jackson bad on tape. But to start with Alice in Chains, like, oh, my God. Yeah, I mean, those are kind of like the first kind of records. I was. I mean, I did buy things in the 80s because I'm in 80s, yeah. up, you know, Bobby Brown and Nana Cherry and stuff like that. But I wasn't sort of what I would say, like. I mean, I liked the music, but it was those albums that I thought, you know, I've got myself a CD player. That's what I'm going to go and buy. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's awesome. And what about live bands? Because one of the first bands I ever saw at Wolverhampton Wolfram was Green Day. And that was when I realized that bands sounded just as good on CD as they do in person. And I was probably only 14 or something. But I remember being blown away by the fact that free people could make that much noise. But what was that first gig that you remember that made you probably think, I want to be in a band one day. I want to be like them. 
my first gig was Guns N' Roses at Wembley Stadium. <laughs> Fucking hell. You obliterate That's everything it. at the moment. Supported by Faith No More and Soundgarden. <sighs> so Why would you ever go to happen. another gig after that? Ever? Well, to see Faith No More and Soundgarden again. Yeah. Um, but um, that, <laughs> that truly blew me away, that gig. Um, and I think I was 16 or 17. So, you know, there wasn't sort of much going on around my area. And... You know, I was a big Guns N' Roses fan and, you know, the tickets were up for Wembley Stadium and me and my friends all went to, a, it was like a local travel shop and it was like 30 quid for the ticket back then. And then we all sort of jumped on a train at like 6am in the morning and then just had a massive long day and just loved it. And even at the show, I, I think I got separated from my friends like really early on, but everyone there was just having such a good time. It didn't matter who you spoke to. It was a real kind of community thing, which I really, really enjoyed. Um so for me, that was like, you know, this is this is something that's awesome. And then, you know, you watch someone like Mike Patton and you go, yeah, I want to be a singer. Yeah. I mean, to get lost at gigs back then, I went to one of the original Ozfests in the UK. And I remember you would never te- you would never have a mobile phone to text your mates and be like, oh, I'm over here. But it wouldn't matter because everyone was just there for the same reason. And just absolutely. There was no yeah. phone. So you could actually just enjoy a gig. Yeah. The meet up point you know i'll meet you by that hot dog stand or something <laughs> you know, at four o'clock if we get separated or before we go and watch another band so you kind of did that um old school but yeah it was brilliant it was a brilliant it was a great kind of experience and our drummer andy buse was there as well but i didn't know him at the time that's amazing uh, and then with 100 reasons before you started 100 reasons were you in lots of college bands and school bands and doing the whole battle of the bands thing or did it kind no, of any... I mean... It's quite funny. We did like a local battle of the bands, which we lost, and it was a fix. I can tell you that now. It's Bastard, fixed. still bitter now. Yeah, the band that won, no way. Fix. I'm joking. Um, it, yeah, it was still a fix though. But yeah. Um, so the thing was, is kind of at school there wasn't really much opportunity to sort of be in bands, and you know, to try and sort of be a singer. It wasn't really sort of when I started going out to nightclubs and stuff, and you know. You kind of heard, you know, you saw bands. I used to go and watch bands. I used to kind of sneak into pubs and stuff underage and watch local death metal bands and stuff that were doing the rounds and things like that, which is good fun. But then sort of sort of being in a band was, you know, a little bit sort of later on because I just wasn't around the people that were doing it. And then I don't know why somebody thought I was, you know, capable of singing, but somebody asked me and then I was like, yeah, right. And I joined a band for a bit and then it went from there. With the kind of debut of Ideas Above Our Station, genuinely, and I'm not just saying this, I interviewed um, Will from Headers for Heroes last week and I was talking to him about you guys. I truly mean this. I think it's probably one of the best debut albums of all time up there with like Ruben, Race Cars, Race Car Backwards. There's not one bad song on there. Every single song could be a single. And you must have been so proud of the way that album turned out because it just blew up, didn't it, within a few weeks? Yeah, but I think also... You know, it's one of those things, Mark, where a lot of people seem to think that things happen overnight and they don't. You know, Hell is for Heroes are the same. Yeah. They've been working, playing shows for like a year or two beforehand. So you kind of already have a good idea about sort of what the songs are going to be, but you've already been laying a lot of groundwork in, so that, you know, you've got somebody there to to buy the record when it comes out. Um, and then when you've got a label that's working really hard and doing a really good job as well, you know, of letting people know that you're doing stuff, um, then it, it's just one of those things where it sort of all came together, like at the same time. And I I think sometimes people maybe sort of, you know, think that some of these things are sort of overnight successes. And in some cases these days, you can absolutely have that. And that's brilliant. But, you know, we worked really hard behind the scenes. You know, we went on one of my first tours with an amazing band called Idlewild. But we still had jobs and we'd finish a show in Leicester and I live down south and you're finishing the show, getting off stage, going home to get up for work the next day, you know, getting two or three hours sleep. You're sleeping on the gear in the back of the van. You know, we did a few shows with rival schools before, you know, and I remember Andy Buse was like starting a new job the next morning and it was his birthday. And <laughs> Jesus. We helped, and we helped rival schools with all of their gear, right? Drove back from Leeds with rival schools to take them to the airport um and then we all went to work the next day so you know you're really you know you're doing it behind the scenes and but that's also what i think people sort of buy into you know in terms of your work ethic and your you know your willingness to kind of not do what it takes in an extreme way but just you know you've got the work ethic and you want to do it um so yeah 
and then you've got a good team behind you at the label that's working really hard so yeah i'd say it's all like a nice culmination of everything i was at a lot of those early shows i used to live in leicester i went to uni there and i was always at the charlotte so i saw you guys playing i think with million dead i, I definitely saw you with rival schools um and i saw the build-up with each ep that came before it i remember going and queuing up and getting the actual cd of the early oh, cool. <laughs> releases and then when the album finally came out um i think there was like an enemy tour or something that you did and went around to universities Watch and that. stuff yeah. uh and i'm sure it was like you and lost profits and other but i'm sure it was like this lineup of I think we did do a few shows like that. Yeah, I remember. I remember doing a show and like Andy Buse pretty much getting food poisoning from like uh, something dodgy that was cooked for us that day. And then I don't think, I think we finished that tour or we did a few shows. It wasn't, the enemy tours aren't, they weren't sort of huge. I think we did like a few shows and then I remember doing some stuff with Ash and Coheed and Cambria and stuff, which was awesome. Um, and then we went up to Glasgow, I think, to do a show at King Tut's and Andy, our drummer, was just sick. <laughs> for um yeah rock and roll people but there was this kind of movement wasn't there for the british scene you had bands like a ruben uh biffy clara at the time was just coming through with their stuff as well and all of you kind of had this really good timing i remember bands like cave in and stuff yeah. and there was this really good moment you know i think it must be like 2003 or i don't want to I, I can't remember how old i was but i remember all these bands coming through and it just felt like this really good moment for british music I mean, it was, and and everybody was, you know, good friends, and everyone was, you know, happy about everybody doing, you know, everybody was doing their own thing, and just everyone was having a good time, and yeah, it was a brilliant time to be in a band, um, and you know, touring with people, playing shows with people, you know, I used to go and watch A before I was, you know, doing anything, so you know, they come to my local town and I go and watch them play, you know, and that was really cool, and then like, and I remember once we before we were sort of even sort of 100 reasons and we were having a few chats and stuff and Karang were taking a bit of interest you know somebody did us a favor and sort of got us into an a gig at like the wedge rooms in portsmouth and like wow we're gonna go meet a this is so cool um and it was it was brilliant it was amazing and then you're like oh yeah and then later on a couple of years later you're just hanging out and it's oh right jace yeah you know so it's it's it was lovely and it was great and the thing that i find really sort of heartwarming is just how good all the bands were everyone was great you know, and um, and that's why it's kind of a good time, because whenever you're sharing the stage with these people, you just knew everyone hopefully in the crowd was having a good time because everyone was good. Does it feel weird that you kind of uh, had that massive success with the debut album? I even saw you guys. I'm sure it was on top of the plop, top of the plops. Bloody that be a whole new show. Yeah, about right, yeah, yeah. Um... Top, top of the pops. And you played silver, and I remember thinking, "Fucking hell!" Like these guys have made it. Um, were you kind of too caught up in it at the time because it was going at such a pace? Once the album was out, were you able to kind of step back and reflect, or were you just kind of enjoying every day for the moment I think there's you had? A lot of that. There's a lot of sort of just being in the moment as much as you could possibly be. Um, we all hated doing Top of the Pops anyway. Um, seemed, I mean, we've told the story before, but, you know, we were supposed to have a day off and go surfing um, down in Cornwall, but they're like, you got Top of the Pops. So we finished a show in Cornwall and overnight to London um, to do that. And none of us wanted to be there. Um, but, you know, that was one of the things that you've got to do it. But it's also like one of those benchmark things where people at the time, you could say to them, you've done Top of the Pops, and that would be, oh, so you're doing all right then, um, rather than the fact that you've just been slogging away for ages and you're playing, you know, really good shows and shows are selling out and things like that. No, no, it's Top of the Pops. Um, <laughs> so but that's that's the every man's kind of benchmark, you know, because, yeah. you know, I talk to people or whatever, or, you know, and say, oh, you're in a band, are you? Okay, what, what pubs do you play? And it's like, nah, a bit beyond that now. Um so yeah but when you so you go oh yeah play told the pops and they go oh so yeah bit of that you're famous right. then if you if you got to sh you know be on the same stage as the spice girls i know right what could be better my but god anyway, um, yeah <laughs> did, did it feel like uh a lot of pressure then to try and top that debut that everyone does because you know hell is for heroes had the neon handshake uh, Ruben had race cars, race car backers. So There's these debut albums that really kind of left your mark on the industry. Did you feel pressure then to come back and try and top it? No. Um, <laughs> it's a very Big short most answer. answer. Yeah. yeah Next because, question. Yeah, but well, the thing for us is we've never really been into sort of feeling pressure from a writing sense. Um, we we had pressure probably I think with our fourth record where we felt that we weren't necessarily ready to 
record it um, because the songs we felt could have been, you know, just had a little bit more time to, you know, to, I don't know, marinate or whatever you would like to say. But with the second record, we were having a good time. You know, we went down to Cornwall and hang out there for a few months writing. And yeah, there, there wasn't really sort of any real pressure. It was just, well, okay, time to write some more songs. Let's do it. And we did. So, you know, all that's going to do, you know, whenever you're writing stuff, whatever phase you're in, you know, we certainly didn't apply any pressure or feel like, oh, no, we've got to follow up with something, you know, like this or like that. We just we've always just written the songs that are, that are in us at that time um, and not really worried about anything else. Because if you kind of start to do that, then you start to, I don't know, can kind of sully what you're doing. You know, if you're thinking about pressure or you're thinking about trying to achieve something or maintain something, then the only thing that's going to suffer is your music. Um, so true so so true i mean you don't need to add more pressure onto yourself anyway do you really it's like why would you inflict all that just to kind of make yourself fail if you then worry about it too much i think the the thing about the band that we have is any pressure that was felt was was probably more internal where you know we're all making sure that we're pulling our weight and contributing creatively and making sure that we're all doing the best job we can live you know that's the only real pressure um, because you don't want to let any of your bandmates down and they didn't want to do the same. And that's not something we've necessarily sort of spoken about openly. It's just things that I I sort of thought about where you just want to, you know, the people in the band, you know, I love those guys and I respect them massively. So you want to kind of do a good job. And, you know, we don't talk about it, like I said, but they they think the same <laughs> the other way yeah. around. You know, um, you know, in terms of rehearsals for the new shows at the moment, you know, Andy Buse has been practicing for like the last two or three months solid making sure it gets it all right. And, you know, we're all doing our bit. We're all doing our homework before we're even in a room together because it's important. Um, yeah, there we go. I mean, I saw you guys come back for an anniversary tour with Hellas for Heroes. I think it was down in London. Um, yeah. And it was like you'd never been away. You genuinely were as good as you were the, the the first time I ever saw you. And the hunger was still there. And you didn't just, you know, some bands you see on stage that have come back it's a bit of a cash grab. You can see they're not really into it. They're just going through the motions. But you guys were as hungry as you've ever been. And it was so good to see the crowd. Like, you must have been surprised that they sold out in minutes, didn't it, in London? It was like absolutely yeah, we insane. Were <laughs> we were surprised. Yeah. Um, but it's exciting. You know, playing shows and being able to do something like that is is not what everybody gets to do. So you're in a a privileged position. You know, you've managed to make music that, you know, has had an impact on people. People want to hear it and they're going to come out and see you play. That's amazing. Um, and so for us, we've just never taken that for granted and we've never taken our audiences for granted. And, you know, the shows were something, there was a meaning behind it. There was a reason to do it. Um, and as long as that's there, and I don't mean that in a monetary way, I mean that is in a, a psychological reason, you know, this will be really good. This will be great fun. Let's go on stage with some friends and play some songs that we still love in front of a bunch of people that want to hear them brilliant it doesn't get much better than that does it really exactly so for us it's like yeah okay let's do that then and if you know the thing for us is it's it's always got always got to feel right from sort of an emotional perspective um because obviously there is other sides to being in a band like the business side and everything else but ultimately we've always played because we love playing and yeah that's that's why you do it so you should be enjoying yourself and is that why you guys decided now to come back again? Uh, obviously, again with um, Headers for Heroes. And is it My Vitriol are opening them for you? Yeah, yeah that'd I mean, be great. Fucking um, hell, what a band they are. Yeah, My Vitriol are amazing. Um, and, you know, Som's great. Ravi's great. Um, you know, we've played with them before, like at festivals and stuff. And, you know, um, Som and I message each other from sort of time to time. And we're just like, even just yesterday, we were messaging just about, can't, haven't seen you for a while. Can't wait to see you. Shows are going to be great. Everyone's just over the moon, you know, to be to be doing this. And obviously, Hellas for Heroes are just, you know, they're they're always brilliant, um, great band. So it is a great bill. It's it's something to sit there and go. Do you know what? I just know that no matter what's going to happen tonight, everyone's hopefully going to have a really good time because yeah, the bands are awesome and everyone's on their game. So um, yeah, it's it's a privilege. To go as well and give us brand new music as well. I, I keep seeing like every week a new single from you guys. I'm like, fucking hell, like it's all coming out. And it's like, I think I've got five or six tracks now on Spotify of the new album. And I'm like, okay. so excited that we're getting the uh, tracks ready for the, the end of February. And 
do you guys think you needed that time out? I know it's been a while, but the fact that by album four, I, I listened to an interview with Larry the other day and he said, and it's not, it's not any dirt on the band. He was just like, we just weren't enjoying it anymore. Our hearts weren't in it by album four. Do you yeah. think having that time out, doing other stuff, being adults and getting married or having kids and doing whatever you do and then coming back, does it feel like a whole new band again? It does. And you know, in a really good way, because everyone's kind of got on with their lives and no one's been sort of dwelling over what could have been or, you know, no one's bitter or anything like that. It's just something that at that point had ran its course. Yeah. And, you know, we're not on the treadmill anymore. We're not trying to please anybody. We've just managed to, again, just get in a room and write some amazing music. Um, And I think that's what sort of most proud of with the new material i mean i know we're sort of five songs in at the moment but the rest of the album is easily just as good uh, if not better at points so people haven't even i don't think they've even heard the best of the record yet and i love what we've released so far so you know we're we're beyond proud of what we've managed to get out of this you know in terms of our creativity um but when there's no pressure and it was just like, well, you know what? You kind of sit down and you talk about it and go, well, let's just, and we did this. We just thought, well, we don't know what's going to happen, but let's just get in the studio and write and, and see if anything comes out. And that was the thing. So again, no pressure, no great goal about coming back and trying to be superstars or anything like that. That's not on the agenda. The agenda was, do we, we'll go in and we'll just see what happens. And every time we went in to write, something amazing happened every time. do do you think it's because there's no expectations there's no pressure on yourselves you're just doing it for the music and having fun yeah because it's just you know doing that you know should be easy and you know don't get me wrong some songs might need a little bit more work than others every now and then but this album like every time we went in to write something amazing came out of it every time it's so exciting, man. There's only got a few weeks to wait now, but it's like, no, I can't excited. wait. I'm excited because, I, you know, obviously I've sat on these songs for a long time and I just yeah. can't wait for people to hear it because it's just incredible. And I, it, I'm i probably using those words because I, I genuinely just think that what we've made is the, the most amazing record we could ever make. I really do believe that. And it's it's amazing. And I just want people to hear it um, because, yeah, it's it's special to me. It's dear to my heart. And it is an absolute product of genuine love, um, working with great people. Um, yeah, what can I say? I'm so I'm so kind of proud of you guys and so happy because to see an anniversary show for an album or to go and see those bands that you saw 20 years ago, you know, doing a tour is fucking awesome. You know, as a fan, you know, you, you go to the gigs and everyone's got a bit more grey hair and a bit bit of a beer yep. belly and you're still wearing your old hoodies hoping that they still look all right um, the mosh pit at the show <laughs> i'm by the sound desk now i can't go down the mosh Everybody pit I'm like, just be there, hopefully just nodding their heads yeah and the equivalent of them absolutely going off that's it <laughs> oh it was absolutely mental last night i tapped my shoe twice but um oh, that'll be it but but there's something really you know nostalgic about it. But to have a a kind of mix of new songs thrown in on the set list is going to be amazing. And have you got kind of the set down in your kind yeah. of yeah? Is it all is it all yeah. there ready? And there's lots of new stuff to kind of fit in between the classics. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> and is it working well? Because sometimes you write a song, you go in, you produce it, you put some extra guitars in, you do some harmonies, and then you go, fuck, how are we going to pull this off live? Are you comfortable no. that they're just... Yep, yep. it's all worked out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, you know, we're, we're you know, the, the, you know, Larry's a record producer for a living. So, yeah. you know, so all of that stuff sorted out. Um, Andy Buse is in the touring world now as well, at a very high level. Um, so he knows how it all works. Everybody's... You know, we've had the set list floating around like that we're happy with for at least a month. So, you know, and we've had our first rehearsal a couple of weeks back, which went amazing. Um, and then obviously we've got more coming up before the tour. But I, I couldn't be less worried about it if I tried. Because um, like I said, everyone's on their game and everyone's in the mood for it. You know, everyone's up for it and it's it's a good thing. Everyone's excited. So, yeah, the set, I, I think the set's amazing. Um, you could always argue that could you keep everybody happy? Possibly not. Never going to happen. But we're really going to try. <laughs> you know, I'm in a I'm in a position where, like, you know, I pretty much like all the songs we've written, so it's not about 
you know worrying about whether you know I, I'm I'm not going to be bored on stage that's for sure um but I just you know you just hope you pick the right songs that people are going to want to hear so there's a few sort of obscure things from the back catalogue um some stuff that's sort of album tracks and obviously we're going to play silver and if I could and I'll find you and stuff like yeah. that because you know that's that's going to be there so yeah it's a nice selection from across the back catalogue with some new stuff have you kind of thought to yourself am I going to have to like a half time point where I go and get a drink and kind of do some stretches because I'm not 20 anymore and I can't swing the mic around as easily and jump around I mean you know I mean I'll be honest with you my knees maybe aren't what they once were um but you know I've just done some shows with my um another band I'm in called they fell from the sky and they went really well um so now I'm not worried and, and like I say everyone's rehearsing you know the Andy plays bass in Raging Speedhorn so he's playing yeah. shows all the time I haven't really stopped playing shows. You know, Andy's been practicing, Larry's been practicing. Uh, we've got a stunt guitar player coming in as well who's helping out. Um, so, you know, we'll make sure the sound's all nice and fill, filled and full. Um, so, yeah, we're just, just yeah, it's going to be a great time. God, it's exciting. And I saw only last week the latest uh, poster for 2000 Trees and your name is so big, bang in the middle uh mm-hmm. and it and it's it's glorious to see but one of the things i noticed in all the comments on the official pages is everyone was like fuck t-, you know i can't believe it 100 reasons are playing and everyone is so excited do you feel like that's kind of feels like a bit of a homecoming as well because that festival is so nostalgic and so supportive of these bands like we've mentioned today yeah i i love 2000 trees um i've played there four times now i think so i did it with 100 reasons way back then me and the Andy did some acoustic stuff a couple of years and then last year I did it with they fell from the sky and they're just wonderful human beings and they do it for the right reasons they love music you know I saw a shed load of new bands um announced the other day you know Simon Neal's band I think it's Empire State Bastards or something are playing um um, how cool is that gonna be you know yeah exactly um so you know there's loads of again I'm gutted I think as rival schools I think are playing on the Friday and we're playing on the Saturday so I'm not going to see them, which is disappointing. Um, but yeah, it's just it's come down the day early and hang out. Well, you say that, but there might be other things going on that day. Oh, um, so in fairness, you know, it's 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 a brilliant festival run by brilliant people um, that, that just do it for the right reasons. So if there's any festival I'd want to play, it, it would always be 2000 Trees. I love it. Yeah, I went last year. Uh, I was doing press there and sitting with some bands and stuff, but I um it doesn't it feels the right size it feels like you know everybody even though you don't everyone seems familiar and it's all about the music and it's i don't know it just felt like this incredible unity between everybody it was so nice there was no dickheads no fighting no idiots it's just really beautiful that's exactly what you get at 2000 trees um but they you know but they set the tone you yeah. know um, you know the you know the intolerance of misogynistic twats and things like that is sort of well documented you know that kind of you know, behavior is just not welcome there. And that's brilliant. So, you know, they spend a lot of time in, you know, making sure that everybody that goes to that festival can have a good time. Love it. It's amazing. And I suppose I know we're talking February is here, the album, the tour in March with uh, Headers for Heroes and all this is going on. Do you kind of see now you've got the taste for it when these songs are played? Do you think you're going to be announcing a lot more shows, working on more music, or are you just going to kind of see how it goes first? I'm in the moment. Yeah. right now so i certainly haven't thought about writing any more music at all um i'm just more excited about people listening to the stuff that they haven't heard yet um, um so that's you know not even a discussion and yeah in terms of more shows it's you know if, if something comes up and it feels like the right thing to do and it's cool um probably yes um but at the moment genuinely telling you right now um nothing is on the cards beyond 2000 trees at the moment but that's quite not cool even, isn't it like february's no, gonna february and march squirrel. is awesome yeah but not even secret squirrel so that doesn't mean that won't change by the end of today <laughs> uh when i'm talking to you but at this time genuinely um we have nothing booked past 2000 trees not even you know on the hush if i go on to your website at five o'clock tonight and then suddenly <laughs> fucking will tour <laughs> then then yeah um i'd be surprised too actually because <laughs> yeah no one's told you yet well that's a conversation with the wife isn't it you know yeah. see, i'm off on tour no 
Um, so, you know, yeah, that's that's not on the cards at all right now. Uh, but yeah, again, sort of never say never. You know, we're just enjoying what's going on right now. Looking forward to people hearing the rest of the record and playing some really cool shows with some really cool bands. And, you know, the shows that we do are always kind of like sort of reunion fests and stuff like that, you know, where you, yeah, you just see people faces that have been supporting you for a long time. It's, it's great. It's all positive and I can't wait. I've got, I'm coming to see you guys in Birmingham, so I'm seeing the guys from Hell's Rose, but if I see you around, I'll grab you a beer and uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing these songs live, especially the new stuff. I just, It's like you've never been away. It's, it's Obviously, Larry's production is incredible, but it sounds fucking epic already. Yeah, it, it, it does. I can't. Not, I'm allowed to say that. <laughs> if does. you're a fan of your own music and it's not like, oh yeah, we've got to tour these songs and oh, I've had the album for two years now, so it feels weird. You're fucking a huge fan of your own music. So isn't that a good thing? It is a very good thing. I love it. Exactly. I finish every episode of Mark and Me with, and we're at 250 episodes plus now. The wow. guest who comes on gets to choose the outro piece of music and I put you on the spot. So... You can have any song by any band or any piece of music or any song from a film score, but I am going to put you on the spot. And I think bands find it hardest because you've probably got right, five. Got one. Oh, fucking hell. So what is it? I'm going to go with a band called Vukovi, which I They're, love. They've been on the podcast. Fucking incredible. Yeah. Love that band. And we'll just go with I Exist. So it's incredible. Is that just your just sole reason is just because it's incredible? Um, I've, I've kind of very recently discovered them. So apologies, because I think they're about three albums in um but the new album just kind of that track just came up on a playlist the other day and i'm addicted to that band at the moment they are really nice people as well i interviewed them at 2000 trees and they're just lovely amazing yeah but just incredible so i love that record i love that band right now so that one please amazing colin uh i've been waiting to get you on this podcast for quite some time but i think it's always about just waiting for the right time and <laughs> As the Thanks. band is literally going through this resurgence and about to take over the world again, I'm really excited as a fan. Um, and I just want you to know how much I appreciate your time coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me, Mark. Really, really good to meet you. So, yeah, thanks a lot. And, uh, yeah, I'll see you in Birmingham. I can't wait, dude. Enjoy the rest of your day. I hope all the rest of the press goes well. And as soon as I've got that album, I'll be promoting the fuck out of it for you on all my socials. Amazing. Thanks a lot, dude. Take care. So there it is. There's my interview with me and Colin from The Amazing 100 Reasons. What an amazing guy. As I said at the start of today's interview, someone that I've wanted on this podcast for a very long time and it didn't disappoint. He's just an amazing all-round nice guy. He's a great singer, a great songwriter, an amazing lyricist and just, I don't know, I just felt a really good vibe from the moment we started talking. So I want to say a massive thank you for Colin for coming on the show and I can't wait to see you guys absolutely rock it out this weekend in Birmingham. I literally feel like a 20-year-old again, getting excited to go and see Hell is for Heroes, My Vitriol, and 100 Reasons. It feels really odd, but I'm not complaining. And if you're listening to today's interview and you haven't checked out the 100 Reasons brand new album, Glorious Sunset, please do, because it's absolutely awesome. There's no bad song on there. They're back with, honestly, an absolutely epic album, the production's amazing, Colin sounds amazing, the guitars, the bass, the drums, the songwriting. It's like they've never been away and I absolutely adore it. If you've really enjoyed today's episode, all that I ask you to do is please share this. You can go on to markandme.com and on there there's links to my Facebook, Twitter and Instagram pages. If you've really enjoyed it, it's literally the click of a button. You can share it on Instagram, share it on Facebook, retweet it on Twitter and it all goes a real long way in helping to get the word out there for Mark and me. And like I said, it costs you guys absolutely nothing. And if you've really enjoyed today's episode, I do have a Patreon account. On there, each and every month, I have some exclusive episodes just for you guys at home. They are called The Lost Tapes, and they're basically only available to anyone that supports me on Patreon. And the next one of that will be out next week. Also, I give some badges away, I have some amazing competition prizes and lots of different goodies that are exclusive just to say thank you for supporting me on Patreon. But as I said, the link's on markandme.com and all the support that goes into that goes right back into the podcast. I don't make any money off it and it allows me to host the podcast on a number of different directories, get out there, conduct more interviews and as I always say, that gives you guys at home a lot more podcasts. I'll be back in only a few days' time with another brand new episode. But until then, go and see 100 Reasons, listen to 100 Reasons, look after yourself, take care, and I'll speak to you all very soon. Stand up, you've got to find It's a temporary feeling, not like suicide
free.